What's up, survival dog? What's going on? <whistles> Come here. Come here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. This is Rascal. Make sure he doesn't get run over. His name will be Rascal Flats. Painful. Been watching the news lately. There's a lot of stuff happening in the world. And I know a lot of people have concerns about prepping for grid down. So this is Tyler with Survival Dispatch. And that's what we're going to cover today. This is my little friendly YouTube compliant reminder that you got to have these for prepping for grid down too. Prepping for grid down. There's a lot of things that you can do. The problem is you really need to have a problem before you have a solution. Everyone wants to go buy a bunch of stuff and stick it in their basement. That doesn't really fix any of the problems. So let's identify the problem. If you have a simple way of looking at things and you say, in my area, what is the most likely man-made scenario that could be the worst probable scenario and what's the most likely natural scenario that could be the worst possible scenario. Plan against those things. Now you've got a problem and now you can institute a solution. I live in Utah. In Utah, I'm going to guess the most probable worst case man-made scenario is a war, a nuke, an EMP, some sort of big thing. Well, with that comes power outages. With power outages comes supply issues. With supply issues comes no gas, no electricity, no phone. Now I know how to prepare against that. I can take a Bosch solar panel right like this. I can stick it, I don't know, my back porch on the top of my vehicle. And now I've got indefinite and unlimited communications as long as a cell phone works. Or I've got indefinite and unlimited communications as long as I've got a Garmin device that can send a text to a satellite or a radio. The point is, power is solved. Now, if we say, what's the most probable, uh, natural, worst case scenario? Well, I bet that's gonna be an earthquake. If an earthquake happens, communication will work outside of the affected zone, satellites will still work, but my ability to travel and sustain will be limited. Okay, well, maybe I need food storage. Maybe I need a vehicle that can crawl over the things. Maybe I need a e-bike or a motorcycle or something like that. If you're prepping for grid down, we've made some assumptions. We're assuming that normal systems that we rely and depend upon every day are not functioning. And the way to prep against those type of normal systems that are down is to purchase or grow or institute systems of our own that we have 100% control on. In every scenario, from just living to being in a survival situation, you need fire, you need water, you need shelter, you need communications, you need medical, and you need the ability to replenish any of the stocks that you've lost. Fire, that's heat, that's clothes, that's the building that I'm in, that's the ability to purify water, that's more than just a flame. Water, water's water. You need a source to renew it, you either need a stockpile of water or you need the ability to get more of it and purify it. Shelter. Shelter is your clothes. Shelter is the food that you eat that makes you warm. Shelter is your house. With that comes the need to electrify it, the need to heat it. So keep those in mind. Food. You can grow food. You can shoot food. You can store food. So food is something that is replenishable and a little more dynamic. Communications. Communications are probably one of the most important and most overlooked things when it comes for prepping for grid down. Communications give you the ability to call for help, get backup and support, call for an extraction, and potentially avoid the entire situation to begin with. Communications give you early warning, the ability to listen on an adversary that may be advancing against you. They give you ability to call your other buddies and have them bring you fire, water, shelter, food that you need. Communications may be one of the most important things that we gotta prep against grid down for. So I've got my phone. My phone doesn't work without electricity for more than a day or two, especially if I'm using it constantly. My phone doesn't work. If there's not a system to connect it to, my phone won't work anyway. The phone is a great thing that gives you apps and GPS and compasses. And there's a lot of value to having a phone, even if it can't connect to a system. So if we start saying that communications and the ability to replenish them indefinitely means a phone, a ham radio, a sat phone, a text device, and the ability to recharge it indefinitely, 
The thing about a phone is it comes with the battery and that battery dies after a certain amount of time. Maybe I've got 24 to 48 hours with the battery inside my phone. Now it's dead, all my apps are gone, all that stuff is non-functioning. I have a dark energy Poseidon battery right here. It's awesome. Gives me the ability to take that 48 hours, maybe turn it into a week. If I'm conservative with it, maybe turn it into a listening mode for up to a month but it's still gonna run out of electricity. So what do I do once I hit that limit? Well, you either get a bigger battery or you get a solar system. One of the systems that I like to use is Bose RV. Bose RV is not just for RVs. This panel happens to be the panel that I'm gonna stick on my Trooper. So that's why I'm showing it to you today. This is one panel that I like because it's flexible, it's thin, it's lightweight, it'll put 200 watts out, if you guys want to zoom in on the specifications right there, I don't want to deep dive a lot of the nerd stuff. It's copper, indium, gallium, selenide. If I said that right, it probably didn't. What matters to me is it's thin. It can handle a lot of impact. It's waterproof. I could tape this to the side of a building, the top of a car, whatever. And now I have a massive extension on my time that my communications are going to work. I have the ability to talk for a bigger duration of time. Food. If the grid goes down right now, the first stuff that's gonna die is what's in your fridge. So you need a plan for this. One of the things that I like to do is a gas generator. Its shortfall is that it will only run for so long before you're out of fuel. The other shortfall is gas only lasts for so many months. So you need to use it up within six months to a year, otherwise it's gummy and it's bad fuel. What's up, survival dog? What's going on? Come here. Come here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. This is Rascal. Make sure he doesn't get run over. His name will be Rascal Flats. Painful. Okay, what else are we filming here? Jenny. Mr. Jenny Raider. One thing you can do to keep your fuel lasting a long time is put some of the sea foam in it. Basically, it helps stabilize it so all the lighter stuff doesn't evaporate and leave you with just viscous oil. And when it comes time to starting your generator up, when you actually pull the trigger on it, it will actually start instead of choke because it's got sludge in it. So what's the solution for that? Well, propane. Pro propane is a natural gas that has an indefinite shelf life. It's not gonna go bad. You can get a 100 pound uh, tank of propane, stick it on the side of your house and leave it there until you're 60, it will still be good. So if you want a better shelf stable long-term solution for power, a propane generator with a big tank of propane is going to last for a long time. Its downside is that it's not as portable, right? And propane, is, propane generators aren't going to put out as much juice. But anyway, if the grid goes down right now, the first thing you got to worry about is what's in your fridge. So if you connect it to a generator or have an indefinite solar system with a battery backup, you have the ability to keep your fridge running. The next thing you're gonna worry about is, is it too cold outside or is it too warm outside? In Texas, here a few years ago, or I think it was last winter, all of Texas shut down and they had what I would call average Utah winter temperatures. And I'm not trying to rip on Texas, the problem was that their buildings were not designed to handle this hardcore winter weather and this snow, people were freezing. Now, if you live in a home that's older, it's thicker, it has bricks, there isn't holes where stuff can come and go in the rafters, and your problem is basically solved. If you've got a fireplace, problem solved. But if you live in a home that doesn't meet the extreme temperatures possible in your area, that might be one of the first things that you fix. The grid goes down, you put a generator on your fridge, you have until you run out of fuel, for your fridge to be cold. One of the best things to do is start eating the food in your fridge. All that shelf stable stuff you've got downstairs or wherever it is, that can be eaten later. That steak that's gonna go bad, smoke it. That, that ice cream, okay, it's time to have a barbecue, time to have some ice cream. Start eating all these things so that when the gas runs out, you can now start eating your long-term survival related stuff. Fire, if you can buy a house with a stove, do it, especially in the place where I grew up. I'm, I grew up in southeastern Idaho. We heated our house every year on stove. We had multiple cords of wood stacked seven feet high, four layers deep on the side of our house. I would go out in snow, chop firewood, and we would keep the house running all night long. That doesn't mean that you have to heat your house with firewood. If you have a house that has a normal central heating or AC, 
and you have a fireplace, now you have a plan B solution. You've got a big pile of firewood, you can roast hot dogs in your backyard, or when the power goes out, instead of spending gas and electrical resources to heat the house, you just light a fire. If this isn't an option for you, look into microclimates, small tents in your house, sleeping bags, find a way to make it through, and be cognizant of the fact that cold temperatures will break water pipelines, so turn them off, undo your faucets, let the air pressure, let the water pressure be removed so that there's only air in the, in the lines, so that when it gets warm again, you can turn your hoses back on without breaking your faucets. You're basically winterizing your home like you would an RV. Water. You're gonna have to store big amounts of water and you're gonna have to have a plan to get more water. Once you get it, you're gonna have to have a plan to filter and purify it. Filtering is taking the junk out. Purifying is making it so that it won't kill you when the junk that you didn't take out gets drank. So I'll clarify a little bit. You go down to Georgia, you're looking at a mud puddle, it's got stuff swimming in there. Filtering takes the mud out of it. It's still a tinted, ugly color, and there's still cryptosporidium, giardia, and nasties in there. Now you're gonna use chemicals to kill it, or you're gonna use UV rays to sterilize it, or you're gonna use a really high-grade filter to remove it. Have a plan to take whatever your water source is, purify and filter it, and import it into your local storage facility your big water tank in your basement. Shelter, the most overlooked portion of shelter is food. If you're eating enough and you're wearing the right clothes, you're gonna stay warm. If you're not eating enough, no matter what amount of clothes you have got on, you're gonna eventually get cold. So start with food and start with your clothing. If you're not wearing clothing that gives you the ability to sit at two o'clock in the morning by a fire and not freeze to death, bring another coat. We oft oftentimes, freeze to death for want of one more layer, one more coat, or one more jacket. Your home is also your shelter. I have a plan B for a shelter. In the beginning, we talked about prepping against the two major things. If there's a war that comes and my building gets sh smashed, I need a friend in another state that I can visit. If an earthquake comes and crushes the house, I need a camper in the backyard that's bouncing on springs that is impervious to earthquake, so I can just go from here to there in case of a, uh, a nasty event, in case of an earthquake. Food, I'm not gonna deep dive food too much. There's plenty of videos out on that. You've got the perishable stuff. You've got the long-term dry storage. Have enough for at least 30 days, if not six months to two years. And then have a plan for how you're gonna renew it after that dries up. You're gonna have to start growing. You're gonna have to have chickens. You're gonna have to have cows or something. If you can have that right now, Find a buddy that's willing to go in with you on it and have a plan for the future. Be smart about prepping for grid down. Be realistic about prepping for grid down. Have a plan. Plan for something specific and that will give you specific goals. Take this from some crazy unambiguous idea and turn it into something realistic. Remember, when you're eating an elephant, you eat that sucker one bite at a time. Leave the comments below. Hopefully that's valuable to you and thank you for watching.